hello as usual we have one hour for your questions and my answers this time we do it in english last time we did it in russian next time it's going to be in russian so as we agreed before we're going to switch from language to language let's start with your first question why do we need system anal system analysts and what to do with them in my understanding system analysts are the people who who build the bridge between business domain and technical domain and this is not just mine and my understanding you can get it on wikipedia or in any software development literature software development process if we don't have that people if there is nobody who can connect the technical team with the uh, with the problem team then technical people will have to become knowledgeable in the domain area in the problem domain area so your programmers will have to understand what the business is about if your business is about ordering taxi online then programmers will have to understand how to work uh, how the taxi works what kind of drivers you have what kind of cars are there what kind of problems taxi drivers have to resolve while they use the applications for ordering taxi i believe this is not what programmers must be professional in first of all because it's difficult to be professional in different domains you're the you are a programmer in uh, in taxi business today and then you are a programmer in the oil business tomorrow and then you become a programmer in the banking business so everywhere uh, you go you will have to become knowledgeable in the business domain and this is not a productive career path for programmers so that's that's why uh, in order to avoid that kind of uh, integration of programmers into the business we have system analysts the people who help us us programmers to understand what the business is doing and these people the system analysts they have to uh, they have to be able to explain business requirements to programmers how they do it there are many instruments for that starting from uml diagramming and uh, down to uh, simple storytelling and uh, user stories use cases all kinds of written and even oral materials which the system analyst can bring to us whether it's a good career to be a system analyst that's a probably a question you're also interested to uh, to ask and uh, i'm not so sure that this is uh, a, this is a, a job description which is popular now and which is well paid so not every business understands the necessity to have a system analyst to have a, a requirements engineer that's yet another name for a system analyst not so many businesses would would be able to explain why they need that kind of uh, people in their teams um, don't expect uh, to build a great career if you call yourself a system analyst unfortunately i personally believe that a uh, system analyst is a very interesting job and very important for any business for any business which is uh, which is related to software development somehow next question uh, a good engineer is it the one who finds uh, a proper instrument for the job or it's the one who knows one instrument and always use this instrument that's an interesting question because uh, actually both cases uh, have have their their advantages so if you are uh, if you know one instrument, then you will definitely definitely be very uh, very necessary in certain situations where this particular instrument should be applicable. So, but at the same time, if you know many instruments or you can choose the right instrument, then you would be able to solve many problems, many different problems. In the second scenario, when where you are a jack of all trades so you can find the right instrument and use it it will be easier for you to find a job but the amount of money you will make will be bigger if you are a person of the first category like you know 
one instrument, you know, one particular tool, you know, one particular uh, database. You, you, you not just know how to build a web service, which is almost everybody knows right now. But you know exactly how to put Oracle database in there and how to configure Oracle database indexes so that they uh, so that they optimize the data retrieval better than before. In this case, uh, you will get way more money. You will be way more uh, compensated, well, well better, way better compensated for your work comparing to. But like I said, it will be way more difficult to find a job for you. So you will be looking for different for the positions. You will be looking. You will be looking for jobs, and you will be uh, you you will be holding the job. You, it will be important for you to stay with the job because you will understand that to find another job where your particular skills with the Oracle database uh, might be required it will be difficult. It will take a lot of time for you to find another job like that. So. Maybe if you don't feel yourself as being talented and uh, super enthusiastic about becoming a, 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 a niche professional, then maybe being a jack of all trades and knowing a lot of tools is the right solution. Uh, another question. What kind of art style in painting do you like? Uh, That's an interesting question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm not a. I don't have any particular taste in painting. But uh, I would prefer when I see some pictures in some museums. Then I definitely prefer uh, pictures which have certain meaning, which uh, which deliver some message to us. And if I see a picture where I see, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, a forest, or I see an apple staying on the table, or I see a man sitting on the chair, then I don't understand what exactly was the message. And most probably there was no message. So most probably this painting was created just to, to stay on the wall in some house of a rich man who just didn't know what to put on the wall. And the, that rich man 200 years ago just paid some money to an artist, to a painter, to draw something so that to fill that space on the wall. And now, 200 years later, we look at that and we say, wait, that's so beautiful. That's a that's piece of art. Most probably it's not a piece of art. It's just something that people did for money a long time ago. At that time, they didn't have photographers. They didn't have uh, the, 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 the hardware, the equipment to make a beautiful photo, a beautiful picture of the reality. That's why they were hiring people to paint for them. So most of these, the majority of these paintings, they were created just to, uh, just, to, uh, just to look beautiful, but not to deliver a message. But sometimes there are paintings where uh, there is a story, where the painter actually is trying to tell us something. And not just tell us the... Uh, that, uh, that there is a uh, there is a the story from a Bible and uh, look I'm going to paint it because I know how to do it. It's not really a story coming from the author. It's the it's the story which the author took in the book and again most probably draw this painting just to make money because it's a story who everybody knows and that would that was easier for the painter two hundred years ago to sell that picture because it it's a well known story. Unfortunately, the majority of paintings and the museums, they are like that. They are not really, in my opinion, they're not really a piece of art. They're not really something that, uh, that's, that, is, uh, that is supposed to change something, to, to, to have a meaning, to have an impact on the life of people. And that's what art is for, I believe. Art helps us to deliver a message from somebody who has an idea, who has a pain, who has a, probably a solution for that pain, to deliver that message to thousands or millions of people without explicitly saying what exactly one, the, the, the person wants to say. That's what art is for. Art is just a form, but the art without the content, it's, it doesn't have value for me. So pro, I hope I answered your question. 
The FTC is investigating tech companies' investments in artificial intelligence. Should artificial intelligence be controlled by corporations or organizations like the Free Software Foundation? Uh, I think that uh, the question now is not whether it should or it shouldn't. It will be, like everything else. Everything else exists only when we control it. Again, it's my understanding of how world works. If you want something to work, if you want something to exist, if you want something to live, you're going to control it. You're going to have uh, explicit motivation, explicit uh, intention to tightly control the life cycle of that object or a group of people or a person or, or a country or artificial intelligence. So it will be under control. Who exactly will control it? Who exactly will decide how much we can use it and how, how much we cannot use it? That's a, that's a question which we cannot answer and which we will not be able to, uh, uh, to comprehend the answer to this question. So we will never know who exactly controls it. Like if I ask you, do you know who controls Microsoft, who controls the uh, internet, who controls Bitcoin? No matter what you answer, this answer will be, most probably quite far from the reality because we don't exactly know who controls all of the, all of these things. The same for this artificial intelligence. Somebody will control it. If you ask me whether I think it should be it should be under control, and I think yes, like everything else, the artificial intelligence also should be like internet, like Microsoft, like Bitcoin, all of this stuff, they must be under control. And I am in favor of explicit control. I prefer to know who controls what, instead of having the impression or illusion of no control, the illusion of, uh, of freedom, like this, uh, uh, like Bitcoin gave the illusion of that to us. Like the, they, they said long, like, like 10 years ago that, uh, that Bitcoin is a, is a free currency which has no central uh, control point. But we quite soon realized but that it's not true. But nobody told us explicitly about that. We still have a uh, have a belief that uh, the, the formally, if you if you read the Wikipedia, you will see that uh, that uh, still the promise is the same. It's it's the decentralized currency. It's some instrument which has no central place where people actually decide how it's going to work and who controls what. But we understand that it's not true. Like we see transactions, for example, being uh, blocked recently by Bitcoin, including Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So which tells us that the, the control is in, this is just one of the indicators that control belongs to some group of people, which is, which is undeclared, which is not officially announced. So I'm in favor of control, but definitely we're not going to get that transparency in case of artificial intelligence. We don't know. Remember this story about this uh, OpenAI CEO? We discussed about it a few months ago. How the how he was fired and then he was hired back, and how it was how all of that story looked so suspicious and so um, so un, untrue, so so fake that you know, we definitely understand that. The people who orchestrated that, the people who stay behind all these manipulations, all these movements back and forth, these are the people who we don't know. We don't know their names. And definitely this Sam Altman is just a, is just a speaker. He's just a spoke spokesman. Like, I mean, he, he talks, but uh, it's definitely not the one who makes decisions. Um, what do you do when you're depressed a little bit? That's funny time of for funny questions. Uh, what do I do when I'm depressed? I <laughs> I write code. If I'm depressed, I the best way for me to get out of depression to relax is to just turn off the uh, mobile phone, disconnect all the Telegram chats, just remove them. I mean, not remove them, but uh, uh, close the application so nobody can uh, can can message me anymore. And then I just code for a few hours, just something which I, which is not uh, related to the work I do. Something very open source, something which maybe some some library, some project which I was doing like last year. So I just just get some old stuff which is on on GitHub, which I didn't touch for a year or two. 
I just open it up, I clean it up a little bit, I add some features, that, that relaxes me a lot. And that gives me the, actually open source gives, well, at least in my case, when I see that people actually use the projects on, on, on GitHub, my projects, which I create, that gives me the, uh, a lot of positive, um, positive energy, which kind of, uh, kind of compensate the depression. So it just demonstrates that, look, what you do is needed by somebody. And these people, they're here. Look, they just put the, the stars on your, on your repository. That's, that's great. So your, your work is actually appreciated. I think, I think the best, uh, recipe, the best, uh, pill, the best, uh, medicine against depression is appreciation by other people. That's why we have depression, because we don't have enough appreciation. Or we had it before, and then it, it's gone. So this, this appreciation, which we're, we're used to get for some time, then it just disappears for, for some time, and then we go into depression. But if people appreciate your work, if people tell you that, that what you're doing is actually needed, that we, we want it, we, we, we say thanks to you because of, uh, because of your results, because of what you do for us, you cannot be depressed if you constantly receive this appreciation, if you constantly receive um, gratitude from people who, who use your results. How to generate that? I think open source is one of the great mechanisms to, to get that. Sometimes you cannot get it in your office because your boss, your team, they're not appreciating you enough for some time because you're not delivering enough results. It happens. It happens to all of us. We're not... We cannot be productive all the time. Sometimes we can, we're can we unproductive for a few months. So how do we get this, uh, this feeling of, uh, of appreciation, of gratitude? Open source, in my opinion, is a great uh, solution because there you can get constant appreciation. If you make something useful, if you make some library which will, which will give you a few hundred stars on GitHub, you're going to get these stars like every week. People are gonna subscribe to you. People are gonna follow you. People are gonna email you. Sometimes they're gonna they're gonna ask questions about your product. They're gonna submit pull requests. They're gonna submit bug reports. So there will be activity there, and this activity will create an, a, a feeling for you uh, that you 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 are needed. So that's my recipe. Um, will this? Q&A session be saved on the channel. Yes, it will be. It's all recorded. You can find all our recordings on my YouTube channel, all the previous sessions in recording. Next one. Tesla shares are down more than 10%. How long will the United States be the leader in AI as competitors are already visible on the horizon? Um, I think that the United States will be the leader for for a long time, for as long as uh, as the world around the United States of America will um, will believe in the concept of independence, the concept of freedom the concept of uh, nation be, being proud of their own nations being proud of their own countries being proud of their own history being proud of their own you know, culture as long as we will be divided the united states of america will use this situation for their own purpose for their own good and they will be will be a few steps ahead of everybody else. So the United States actually won, I believe, for basically for two reasons. The reason number one is that they were able to attract immigrants from all the countries in the world. The, the United States of America is built by people who, 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 didn't, who were not born in America, most of them. And their parents, they were also not born in America. So America was able to, uh, to somehow attract people from other nations, from other countries, from other uh, territories to, to join this, this country, the America, and, and work there. That's first. And second, America somehow 
over the last 100 years was able to encourage, maybe not directly provoke, but encourage uh, instability in different places around the world, not inside the country, but outside of the country. The instability based on different reasons, on different motives. Like in some place, it's a it's a war between uh, Israelis and Palestine people. In another place, it's a war based on the different understanding of uh, of the politics, the, the communism and socialism, uh, fascism, all the different uh, political uh, concepts and ideas, which people were ready to fight for. But at the same time, America was not fighting as much. America was building. America was uh, creating wealth cre and attracting talents, attracting people who are not so much interested in, in killing other people, but more interested in, uh, in, in making computers and building internet and creating artificial intelligence. So how to, how to um, be as America <laughs> or maybe how to defend us because I'm not in America now and I don't belong to American economy. So how to defend, for example, Russia? I think the best recipe, or for example, China, the best recipe is to, uh, to realize that, uh, that the conflicts which we have, they are only in favor of the enemies, of, let's say, not the enemies, but competitors. So if, for example, China has a conflict with Taiwan, then this, is in, this only helps America. It doesn't help China. It doesn't help Taiwan. It helps America. So if China would say, like, we, for, we don't care about this. We don't care. Taiwan, not Taiwan. We don't, it doesn't matter for us. Just whatever. Just take this topic off the media agenda. Just remove it. Just let people not pay attention to this. That would be... Uh, that would be beneficial for China, and for example, for Russia, the same. So, if Russia would, uh, instead of uh, instead of uh, discussing the conflict and trying to solve, for example, with Ukraine, trying to resolve this conflict using military power, using diplomatic power, using money, using uh, all the kinds of all different efforts, all of this is only helping America to build AI. But if we forget about this conflict, if we just take it off the agenda, just remove it from the table and let's talk about how we integrate with our friends all over the world. In this case, we will start attracting uh, talents to, for example, Russia or to, for example, China or India, or whatever, any country who is expecting to become as, uh, wealth, as wealthy as America. So asking, answering your question, uh, how long America will be the leader it will be the leader for for very long time because they know they have a very good strategy. They have a very good strategy. They provoke other countries to fight between each other. And at the same time, they create very good conditions, very good situation for immigrants. Just come to us and work here. We are, we are, we are very multinational country, multiculturalism. If you, if, if some of you, have been in America, in New York, in California, you've seen how many different colors, different nations, different people live there. They're not so, they're not, there are no, there are no people who would call themselves as Americans. Most of them are immigrants. Most of them, there are tons of people from India, from China. Look, go to any university in, uh, in California, for example. You will see a lot of students from China, the Chinese guys, Chinese girls. The same for Indian people, the, all the different nations. This is, again, go to, to some university in China. Just fly to Beijing and, and, and attend some university. How many people you will see there who, who look not Chinese, who look not Asian? I don't know, 1%, maybe 0%, nobody. And this is what makes China uh, weaker than America. And it will be weaker for many many decades more so in order to be stronger you need to open the doors not close the doors but open the doors and invite the best talents in and at the same time have a very strict 
filtering mechanism for the immigrants. America has probably the strongest policy for the immigrants. So in order to get the visa, the, the working visa in America, it's probably the biggest challenge among all other countries. Any other country, you can get the working visa in maybe two, three months. In America, you're going to wait for a year. And there's, there are quotas, and it's difficult. And people wait sometimes for a few years before they can get this H-1B visa or something else. And also, America has a lot, many, many different visas for, for top talents. So if you're super talented, if you have some big achievements in your country, then you're, you have a different kind of visa. You can get this O-1 visa or uh, something else. So they have like a, like a catalog of visas, which you can choose if you... If you, are, if you are standing out, so if you have some special qualities, if you have some special skills, which the country needs. So which country has something similar? Like which country has so many options for talented immigrants? And at the same time, very strict rules for not so talented immigrants. So America filters people in. And then these people, they, uh, they, they build AI. So that's the recipe, I think, of success, in particular in America. Next question. How can I request my manager to get more work in cloud DevOps moving from a Linux admin position? Mm. I'm trying to understand the question. What's the difference between, uh, between uh, cloud DevOps and Linux admin position? In my world, it's the same story. Uh, I don't think we have Linux admins anymore like we had them 20 years ago when people were actually really admins. So they were, they, they were having servers and then each server they had Linux and they had to, uh, to enter each server using terminal and then, you, and then you configure your Linux machine there and only, only you know how the machine is configured. I think this time is is gone so we don't do it anymore we have cloud platforms where you just start the server with a click and then in, the, in that server you get the the image which is pre-configured where everything is installed so this image just, just starts up something like that so we don't do any more uh, these linux configuration well unless you have like two servers and that's it that's it that that's your that's your work territory but um in this case, you're not a Linux admin. You're most probably doing it on a part-time, like I have. Like I've, I have six, six ser seven, seven servers. So I have seven, seven servers, which I own, not own, but I rent. No, I have two physical servers and, uh, and then uh, five uh, virtual uh, machines where I keep some stuff, my VPN, my pet projects. But I'm not Linux admin. It's just... It's just something that I do. I don't know how much time I spend every week on this. Maybe five minutes. That's that's all I need to configure these seven servers. So don't call yourself Linux admin if you have a number of servers and you just configure them. Sometimes it's uh, it's a it's a side side track job. But DevOps, I think, is something that we do more now. It's it's kind of an integration between development and operations. That's how I understand DevOps. That's why it's called DevOps. So it's integration of uh, of coding and then placing that code into production and how you do that how you package that stuff how you containerize it how you pre-configure the, the the permissions and pre-configure the, uh, the 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 fault tolerance so that the system doesn't go down when when something happens that's devops and and that's very close to programming i think dev is the largest part in DevOps because the rest is done now by cloud services. And like Amazon, for example, go to Amazon Web Services. You don't need to, sometimes you don't even know the, don't, don't even know, don't even need to know the IP address of your, uh, of your server. All you need to know is just how to log into the, the console of AWS, uh, which button to click, and that's it. They even have now certifications, these Amazon Web Services, where you can pass the exam and prove that you know the right buttons. So you know how to, which button to click and uh, how to configure. 
your console in AWS. I actually tried to get that certificate maybe 10 years ago or something, and I failed. I remembered the question they were asking. I knew the answers to the majority of them. I thought that I knew AWS at that time when it was way smaller than now, it was way simpler, but I still failed the exam. I paid, I think, $250 or something for it. And unfortunately, I didn't get the certificate. I encourage you to try to get it, actually. Now, just since we're talking about that, I think it's important if you consider yourself an AWS expert and you consider yourself a DevOps expert, having that certificate will definitely help. It's like we had Linux certificates 20 years ago. Linux administrators, like you call them, they the good ones, they were getting certificates for Linux operating system. I, I never tried that because I'm not a Linux expert. Next question. What difference between, between software developer and software engineer? Um, you know, I had a, uh, a story that happened a long time ago, maybe 20 years ago. I, I had a, uh, a customer in America and that customer was uh, ordering programming from us. We were writing code for that, for that client and we were uh, sending bills to the customer and he was in Florida, I believe. And in the bills, we were saying software developers and then the time spent by the software developers. And I remember once he asked me, why do you call them developers? They are programmers. They don't develop anything. Call them programmers, call them software engineers, but they're not developers. So that's how I remember the difference between developers and engineers. So I understand, as far as I understand, according to what he said, is that developer is somebody who is taking something which is not developed, which is not used, which is not popular, which is not needed by people, and then make it some, make, turn it into something which is in use, which is needed by people, which is placed to production, which is, uh, which is profitable somehow. So you take it from zero to one. That's when you become a developer. So you develop the software. But if you just sit there and getting salary, for the work you do in the software which existed before you and will exist after you're gone, then you're a software engineer. So you're not actually developing. But now I think this, this software developer uh, is more, probably lost the original meaning like it was 20 years ago. So now everybody is a software developer, everybody is a software engineer, we just don't understand the difference. But I still remember that there is a difference. Since you're asking, I just told you the story, which might be helpful. Uh, US NSA buys web browsing data without a warrant. Do you think it's ethical for government agencies to conduct total surveillance of users? Uh, that's a good question, considering the word ethical you're using. If we have a question like that, if we ask ourselves about morality, about the principles of morality, then uh, we have to uh, first realize or understand where are the standards, where are the rules for the morality? What is the ground for us? What is the, the baseline for the morality? And then according to this baseline, we can say somebody is uh, breaking the, the rule, breaking the law, and somebody doesn't. Like who exactly now in this world at this moment, point of time can say what is, uh, what is ethical in general for the people of power uh, versus people of no power, what is allowed what is not allowed. I don't think we have any kind of standard like this. And I think we, maybe before, like 20 years ago or 50 years ago, we actually had something like this. At least we had an 
at least, at least we had expectations. We had some assumptions about that kind of standard. So we kind of believed that the government is uh, something that belongs to us. They are one of us. They are us. We elected them. They, they are the same people as we are. That's what we thought. But now I, I don't think anyone believes in, in this anymore. Looking at what's going on in the world, in different countries, we understand that the distance between people of power and people of no power is getting bigger and bigger every day. We are just moving on different sides of, sides of the world. On the world of morality, of the world of wealth, of the world of uh, life principles and life standards. It's like we're like becoming two different biological kinds. The people like me and you and the people of power. They live like on a different planet now. And asking what is ethical for them to do against us, it's just... This question doesn't have doesn't have an answer because I can say yes, it's ethical, or I can say no, it's not ethical. Both answers uh, have no uh, have no explanation, have no uh, proof because they don't have the standards. Unfortunately, that's what's going on. I think it, we're we're getting into a situation where the world will become way more. Uh, uh, not way more, but extremely uh, controlled and extremely totalitarian uh, comparing to all the previous worlds we've seen before. So the, the world of Soviet Union, the world, the time of Soviet Union, the time of uh, fascism, is it, it, will, it will look like a joke for us in the next, in the next years, which are coming. So we have... Like, remember this COVID-19 pandemic? The whole world was on its knees just because a small group of people decided to do it. And now we have, you can see that, now we have wars all over the world starting and stopping, not actually not stopping, but starting for no reason, with no explanation, with no meaningful, with no with no possibility to understand what's going on. It's just happening. And we're just sitting there and watching. We're like in a cinema. We're just watching what's going on on the screen. We can't act anyhow. We can't anyhow inter interfere with what's going on. We just observe. We just look at the TV and, and just wait for what happens next. That's what's going on. So the, the con we, we lost our power. If we had it, I'm not sure now that we had it, but now nobody is even trying to pretend that the government actually belongs to uh, to the to the people so it's the, we are we are together so the government was actually elected and these people actually represent the majority of people who elected these people these guys this idea is gone fortunately or unfortunately because you may say that i'm in favor of control right that's what i'm saying that's what i keep saying all over and over again that i'm in favor of control i do love that things are under control and people are under control so i'm in in general in favor of tight control and uh, uh, strict management and the management which is hierarchical it's definitely my understanding of good management i'm completely against flat management flat organizations where people have uh, no understanding of who is the boss or no clear visibility of who is on top of who. I'm totally against that, of that. I'm in favor of hierarchies. And now the world is becoming, you may say so, that the world is becoming hierarchical, right? right? So what am, I what am I complaining about? I'm complaining about the, the, the situation now where we don't understand who is on top of the hierarchy, where the hierarchy... The, the, the top of the pyramid, where it ends, and who are these people? We only see the puppets who we see on the TV. We see these clowns who are changing. They put this guy, they put another guy, these guys talk something, then, then the guy goes, goes away, which disappears, and then another guy is there. This guy continues to talk, says something else. So it, it's clear that there, there are people behind this, uh, this, uh, this theater, but we don't know who. 
and uh, we don't know what they want. That's probably the biggest problem. I'm not so much interested of who they are, like what are the names of the people, but what do they want? Why did we have this COVID pandemic? And we're going to have another one. I, that's what people say, and it's going to happen quite soon. What it's for? What they are trying to, to, to make with us? What's the point? I don't know. Maybe their intentions are good. Maybe. But good in some way, which is, for me, difficult to understand. What, what exactly is good in their minds, in their heads? What, what they believe is good? And probably my understanding of good and their understanding of good. There are two different understandings. Because we, like I said, we live on different planets, which are far away from each other. Next question. Earlier, you said that your books would be available to buy in Russia. How can this be done? Where can I place an order? Yeah, actually, you can buy some of my books in Russia. You just need to join Telegram channel, my Telegram channel. And there I announced... I think two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I announced that I have some, a few books and you still can buy. I still have a few of them left. A few copies. Okay, next question. Any plans to present some major version of Eolang that you're working on? Yeah, we were about the, the major version, maybe it's a little bit too early to say because um, it's quite experimental project still. We have, we have versions, we release them every week. It's an active development right now, but it's too early to say that we may have a stable version, of, of a major version um, within this year. So maybe closer to the end of the year, we'll have something which maybe will be suitable to run some some simple applications and uh, yeah, and build maybe web services with this language this is not this is not the, the intention this is not the, the objective of this project we're not uh, we're not trying to create a replacement for java this was never a goal for this for this project we're not trying to create a language which will be better than c++ we're trying to rethink object oriented programming we know that object-oriented programming is flawed, is, is imperfect, is incorrectly understood by Java and C++. That's what we believe. That the people who created Java and C++, they misunderstood object-oriented programming. And Ruby, and Python, and JavaScript. Actually, JavaScript has the least amount of complaints in my head. Other languages which I just named, they, they were definitely created with uh, with a flawed understanding of what is an object. So we have a different understanding. And in order to demonstrate to ourselves that our understanding makes sense, we started an experiment. We designed a language which is perfectly object-oriented, like we understand. Then we decided to create a compiler for this language to make it working. So it's not just an idea, not a concept, but actually a prototype. So you can write a program in the language and you run it. And we did it. We created a compiler. Then we realized that the compiler is quite slow. So you cannot just use this, these programs that you compile with this compiler as you can use Java programs. Because we compile into the code, which is very slow. Why it's slow? Because we don't know right now how to map objects into machine code. How to map C++ and Java to machine code. We know because objects are different there. Because what is an object is a different thing comparing to, comparing to what we have. So we have a different view of, of, of an object and how to map it to machine code. We still don't we, we still don't know exactly how to do it right, so it so it works fast. And we're thinking about this. And at the same time, the understanding of an object, the understanding of how to do object-oriented programming right is changing for us every month, every year. We we're working on this on this uh, uh, programming language for three years already, a little bit less, like two and a half or something. And and if you roll back two years back, then and ask me what is 
an object and then you ask me now in the, in the same language, in the same programming language, I would give you two different answers. So my own understanding of an object is changing. So that's why I'm saying the project is experimental. So it's not something that we started and we said, look, we know how to make a language which has these and that features. So just give us some time, we implement. It's 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 a research by its by itself. And actually, if some of you who watch me now, if you want to join, if you're interested to uh, to contribute and you care about object-oriented uh, philosophy in general, then we have. We have on-site positions, full-time positions where you can join and we're going to pay you a full-time salary. Actually, not a bad full-time salary because we are. I work in a, in a large corporation, so we can't afford that. And at the same time, if you're remote, if you're not in Moscow, in Russia, and we can work remotely, but at this time, you will have to be a volunteer. So it's going to be open source contribution. We are also uh, looking for such contributors. And we have tasks for you. You can join with smaller tasks, simpler tasks, and then you you become you may become part of the team. If you look at the GitHub repository of our project, you can see that we have more than 40 contributors. More than 40 people wrote code for our repository. While now in the team we have like six people or seven people, something like that. But the total the total contribution is actually was was actually coming and still coming from uh, from volunteers as well. Uh, do you currently use Copilot? Uh, what do you think about it? I don't use Copilot. I tried Copilot two times in my life. I tried it when it was released. That was a year and a half or something ago, and I tried it actually two months ago, and. Both times I was disappointed. I just don't see how it helps. I think that's a that's a dead end in the in the AI for code uh, strategy. I do believe that AI for code is a good strategy. We need it. We need AI for code. But Copilot is not the right solution for a programmer, at least for me. Maybe there are programmers who enjoy it, but I don't like it. Why? Because it makes too many mistakes. And I have no time and I have no desire to every time check whether it is a mistake or the answer is correct. So I type something and it makes suggestions for me. And it makes a large amount of mistakes. When I was trying it for the first time, it was making 50%, maybe not 50, 80% of mistakes. So it was always suggesting me different things. And most of those things, they were mistakenly written. And I was... I was um, I was spending time on reading what is suggested and only then accepting the code. I don't want to do that. It, it, it looks like a it looks like a uh, a pair programmer sitting next to me and making me suggesting very frequently, like every ten seconds, and half of the of those suggestions are wrong. Imagine this situation. Would it be comfortable for you to write code like this? with this guy sitting next to you and telling you three times every minute that, hey, write the code this way. Hey, write it this way. Write it that way. And 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 mistakenly, <laughs> time to time making mistakes, every second time. You would just say, could you please shut up? Let me write code myself. I don't, I don't need your help. Just walk away. Go make me coffee. That's, that's your job. The same I want to do with Copilot. Just go make coffee. And two months ago, I installed it again, and it was an improvement there a little bit, but still, even one mistake out of 10 suggestions completely ruins the idea. I cannot trust that guy anymore because I know that probably there is a mistake. Would be way more convenient, would be way more effective to have AI for code if I would have my code and then... Uh, and then uh, on the right side of the code, instead of helping me to write this, but the AI would just highlight certain piece of the code, maybe somewhere on the right side of the screen, and say, hey, I have a better suggestion how to improve it. And I'm 75% sure that my suggestion is good. Then I might think about this. I see my code. I have some concern about it. For example, this code, I'm not sure it's perfectly written. Then I look at the right side of the screen. I see that AI, this copilot, is actually 
uh, has something to say. So I click that button and then I get some message from Copilot. And then I click, okay, do it, rewrite my code. This would be acceptable. But writing code with me, that's just annoying. It's my opinion. Next question. That's about movie. When I'm going to make a full the full feature movie. Uh, actually, we're making a new movie now. And we're it's still a secret, but we're planning to shoot it probably within the next two months. And uh, it's probably going to be interesting. But it's still short. It's not a full one. It's just 10 minutes or something. For the for the feature movie, you need more time. You need a lot of time. You need that. I, I, I said about this once or many times already on these streams that making movie is uh, maybe... Uh, I don't know, 5% is about art and 95% is just work. And this is exactly true about software development. We are creative as programmers 5% of the time or maybe 1% of the time. The rest of the time, we are just workers. We just need to do our work. We need to be disciplined. We need to be organized. We need to be structured. We need to be motivated. We need to be punished for the mistakes. That's how we work. That's what makes a good software project. Not the creativity of programmers, not their uh, the beauty of their minds. It's the discipline. The same in movie making. A little bit of time you spend on actually thinking, okay, what this movie is going to be about? What is the message to deliver? How these these actors gonna gonna act? What exactly they will have to to tell the uh, the the reader to tell the the audience. That's 5% of your investment. 95, you basically make sure that people do what you want. They get on the, on, on, on the, on the shooting place. They, they don't forget the equipment. They choose the right equipment. They ask you for the money. You pay the right amount of money for them. You bargain with them. You, you discuss how much they, they're going to... You ask them to redo their work. You complain about their quality. You fire them. You find another group of people. That's what is movie making. Not being an artist, as you can imagine, as I was imagining when I joined that that activity. Next question: uh, What is more important to grow from a mediocre engineer to a top engineer? And then it's a list I have to choose from: focus, like attention management, emotions, energy, systematic, intelligence. Or knowledge of multiple applied practices. I appreciate you formulated your question so well. Um, if I have to choose out of these three, focus, intelligence, or knowledge of different practices, I would say that it is um, focus. I would choose focus, the first one. How smart you are. It, it definitely will help if you're smart. But um, like I just said about the movie, it's 5%. Your, your, uh, uh, the capacity of your brain, the ability of your brain to solve complex tasks, the ability of your brain to comprehend complex uh, principles, complex mechanisms, complex ideas is important, but it's 5% of your success. 95% is discipline, is how you actually do the routine work, how you, like you said, you, system, you systematize your knowledge, how you structure your work, how you present your work to other people, how do you publish your work, how you make your work useful by other people how you communicate with the team, how you make sure the team understands what you do. All of that is 95% of, of, of your success. 9% is yes, you have to be smart. But I've seen people who are not so smart, to be honest. They're not bright. They're not, like, they cannot solve uh, some complex tasks like 10 times faster than me. No, they're, they're, they're like me, they're average in their, in their brains. They, 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 the same speed of me. But they... Uh, way more successful because they have than me because they have all the uh, all the qualities which I just mentioned the discipline 
and you also offer the multiple the, the knowledge of multiple practices. Well, this is also important. This is maybe not ten, not five percent, but maybe ten percent, or maybe even twenty percent. Then the ability to apply what you know, to apply what other people did before, to the practical situations. So that's how you drive through the challenges, you drive through your career. So how you um, how you act, how you behave. But seventy percent of your success is your self discipline, is how you. Uh, structure your time is how you uh, like you said control your emotions control your energy how systematic you are i said it probably a few a few streams before it's a quote from bill gates if i'm not mistaken he said we overestimate no yeah we overestimate how much we can do in one year and we underestimate how much we can do in 10 years so we believe that the result is just a few steps ahead of us. Just, yeah, next month. It's going to happen in a few months. By the end of the year, I'm going to be super successful. I'm going to be top engineer. I'm going to, I'm going to be a millionaire. It's, in most cases, it's not happening. What's happening is in 10 years, you become successful. You systematically, in a disciplined way, you do step by step the same thing over and over again. And you step by step move closer to success. And in 10 years, if you plan for 10 years, you have way more chances than if you plan for one year. I would actually not recommend to plan for one year. Just don't. Well, it's well, I do plan for a year. So maybe it's not a it's not fair to say that I don't do that. So I do plan for a year. But a way more important plan for me is the plan for 10 years. So I have a plan for 10 years where I understand how much, what is my focus? So what should I do for the next 10 years in order to achieve what I'm trying to achieve? And that's the systematic work is, is the king. I believe so. In your channel, this next question, in your channel, probably talking about Telegram channel, you recommended the film A Serious Man. That's the movie from um, the Coin Brothers. With the text, the more you watch it, the better it becomes. <laughs> I liked it. I watched it and I liked it. Okay. Okay, that's your question coming. But uh, I was left with a feeling that I didn't fully understand him, the, the movie probably. Could you explain what you see as the main sense and charm of the film and what you discovered in it? Uh, well, this movie is... Uh, about uh, this movie is about uh, probably about what I just told you that we over uh, react to small problems and we underreact to big problems. So I don't want to spoil the, the movie to people who, who uh, haven't seen it yet, but this movie presents a character, a protagonist, who goes through a number of challenges, a number of troubles in his life. And he's trying to solve these challenges, to solve these troubles, trying to find an answer why all the troubles are coming to him. What's, what did he do wrong? He's a serious man, he's saying. I'm a serious man, so I do care about, uh, about what I do. I do care about my professionalism. I care about my family. I care about my job. I care about my morality. He cares about a lot of things. He believes that this is the way, to, uh, this is the way uh, uh, for him uh, to get to, to comfort. He's looking for comfort. He's looking for, uh, for peace. He wants to live in peace. But life is not about peace. Life is full of troubles. And that's what the movie is trying to tell. But that's what the other characters are trying to tell the main, the protagonist, that life is, uh, is hard. And you're going to, uh, you, you never, nobody ever promised you that it's going to be easy. Nobody ever promised you that, that the comfort zone is what you're going to have. That peace is, the peace was not promised to you. 
you were born to fight. You were born to to suffer. You were born to uh, to have troubles. Just just uh, just live with them and and pay attention to troubles which some which are bigger. So with the biggest troubles, you 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 solve them. With the biggest uh, issues, you fight. But the smaller ones, you can ignore. That's what the movie about, is about. Just and, and it's and it's filmed, of course, in a very funny and a very you know, professional way. I've seen it twenty times for sure, many times. I when I when I'm depressed, sometimes I just turn on that kind of movie. Or for example, Jeffrey Lebowski. And the Big Lebowski, also the movie from Coin Brothers, also brilliant work, where they probably tell the same story. So they're actually in their movies, they, they most of their movies are about the same stuff. They're just telling us that uh, that life is hard, but it's fun. We just go through it. We fight. We have troubles. We we we. Somebody dies. Somebody uh, lose money. Somebody gets money. Somebody lose jobs. Somebody, but. This is the, the life. This is what we uh, this is what we have, and nobody promised us anything else. That's that's the best we can get. So it's a quite philosophical movie, and it's well filmed. I can only dream about filming something maybe close to that. Definitely not uh, a masterpiece like that. That's it. We just one hour. I hope I answered your questions. Thanks for coming. See you next Friday. Bye-bye.